Hello, I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the New Technologies in Mathematics Seminar of the uh, CMSA at uh, Harvard University. And today we're uh, delighted to have uh, Michael Bronstein, who's the uh, DeepMind Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the uh, University of Oxford, and is also part of the uh, Cortex Group of Machine Learning Research at uh, Twitter. And he'll tell us about uh, the applications of differential geometry and understanding uh, graph neural networks. So as I always do, I'll offer to uh, watch the uh, chat. So if you have a question and you're not sure about uh, whether you want to ask it, if you put it in the chat, I will either answer it or, or bring it up at an appropriate moment in the talk. And of course, there'll be uh, some time for uh, questions at the end. So uh, with that, uh, Michael, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction and uh, the invitation and everyone for joining. So um, I would like to present today some of the recent works um, that I've done at uh, our group at Twitter in collaboration with uh, colleagues from Oxford and uh, Imperial College. So let me just give you a little bit of context and uh, start with this uh, quote from Hermann Weil, who said that symmetry as wide or uh, as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which uh, man through ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. And uh, probably Philip Anderson, who was uh, the Nobel laureate in physics, uh, put it even uh, more uh, briefly that it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. And indeed, uh, most of modern physics, maybe with the exception of gravity, can be derived uh, from first principles of, uh, of symmetry through uh, uh, things like gauge theory, so the, the, the standard model is uh, a manifestation of this. And uh, symmetry is a deep concept that uh, accompanied geometry uh, throughout the ages. And uh, what happened in the 19th century is uh, a radical departure from the standard geometry that, that prevailed for more than 2,000 years. The Euclidean geometry with uh, introduction or maybe reintroduction in some cases of other constructions that do not satisfy the, the basic assumptions of uh, Euclidean geometry. And in this zoo of different geometries, uh, there was a need to make order, and the order came from Felix Klein with his Erlangen program that suggested to approach geometries as the study of invariants or symmetries, formalized using the, the language of group theory. And uh, he claimed that the projective uh, group is the most general geometry. It took quite some time and effort to integrate also local geometries. And uh, it also gave uh, a, a huge uh, boost of creativity in physics. So uh, results like Noether's theorem that, that shows that conservation laws can be related to, uh, to symmetries and basically a reincarnation of these ideas and even slightly generalized abstract way uh, came to fruition in the, the, the standard um, uh, model that, that we currently know. Uh, category theory is direct descendant of the Erlangen program and so on. So in deep learning, which is uh, maybe a, a more modern field than geometry, we actually have a, a similar situation in the sense that we have a lot of different architectures that were designed for different types of data, but few uh, foundational principles that uh, relate between them and explain them. And that's uh, exactly the idea of, uh, uh, of geometric deep learning that, that we try to advocate uh, to say that we can derive some of the most popular architectures that are now in use in the field from uh, first principles of symmetry. And uh, I gave a talk uh, last year at iClear where uh, I argued uh, that uh, this is the case and uh, maybe in a little bit irreverent way. Uh, we also wrote uh, a book uh, uh, on this topic on geometric deep learning that shows uh, exactly how this uh, can be done. So you can find uh, uh, more details at, the, at this website. But essentially, if we look at uh, maybe a simple setting of supervised machine learning, like this example of uh, image classification, where you have uh, examples of, uh, let's say, cat and dog images that are input into some machine learning system that is represented by this black box here. Uh, so what you try to do is you try to uh, approximate this function that is sampled at a few data points, the inputs for which we know the output of the function, and we try to generalize it, so predict its values at some points that we never seen before, the test set. And the problem with this, uh, uh, with this formulation and with machine learning in general is that 
while we uh, we have good bounds and we have good understanding of how uh, these type of problems uh, work in low dimensional settings, uh, these bounds become meaningless because of the curse of dimensionality in high dimensional setting. And unfortunately, machine learning is mostly very high dimensional. So even images like shown here might be of uh, thousands or even millions of dimensions. Now, what geometric deep learning tries to do is to bring geometry into the picture in a way of remedying the, this uh, problem of the curse of dimensionality uh, in the form of geometric priors. And uh, talking about symmetry, so here is how symmetry is manifested. So we assume that our data, our inputs to a machine learning uh, system, like our images, it's not just a high dimensional vector. So it's uh, a signal that lives on some geometric domain. For example, in case of images, it's the plane or the grid. And the structure of this domain is described by its symmetry group. So in this case, for example, it's the group of translations. So the group acts on the signals through the group representation. And the functions that we define on these uh, signals, like in the example of uh, image classification, have some built-in uh, prior that uh, has the form of either invariance or equivariance with respect to the action of the group. Now, there are many nuances here and allow me to, to not talk about it today, but what is important to understand that the group that is associated of the domain is something that is problem specific. So you can define uh, for the same domain, multiple symmetry groups. You can also have uh, uh, a group that is associated with the data. Uh, so in physics terminology, this is a distinction between internal and external symmetries, symmetries of the space and symmetries of the field. And uh, uh, there are multiple, uh, again, multiple um, interesting theoretical aspects to this. So just uh, two uh, particularly popular incarnations of this blueprint. Uh, so first example is convolutional neural networks. In this case, uh, our domain is a plane and the group is the translation group. And uh, the data are images that live on this plane and uh, the group acts on images through the shift operator. And the functions are equivalent functions with respect to shift, which are the classical convolutions. So here you can basically derive convolutional neural networks from first principles of, uh, uh, of translational symmetry. Another popular architecture that is maybe becoming more prominent in the past couple of years are graph neural networks. So in this case, the domain is a graph. And the uh, particular characteristic of a graph is that we don't have a canonical order of the nodes of the graph. So here the symmetry is the permutation of the nodes. It acts through a permutation matrix on the node features. And uh, then uh, it is implemented. So the, the way that graph neural networks are implemented is in the form of uh, uh, permutation equivariant functions that are achieved by message passing. Now, this blueprint can be applied to a lot of different domains. So it can be applied to grids, it can be applied to graphs, it can be applied to meshes, right? So you can argue that grids are maybe a special case of graphs and meshes are graphs with additional structure. So they're typically cellular or simply shared complexes. And um, one thing that is uh, interesting to observe is that, uh, for example, meshes, you can think of them as discretizations of manifolds of two dimensional surfaces. Uh, grids uh, can be regarded as discretizations of uh, plane or Euclidean spaces, or maybe more generous, uh, generally homogeneous spaces. We don't have a continuous analogy or, or for graphs, and this is quite disturbing. So we'll try to fix this deficiency. Now, if we look into how graph neural networks work, so essentially they uh, look at uh, the neighbors of a node, uh, their feature vectors, they aggregate these feature vectors through some uh, uh, local function that I remind you must be permutation invariant. I think there is some echo. I don't know if there is uh, uh, some, some, somebody has to the, the microphone. Um, so the, the, this function that I denote here by phi is uh, uh, permutation invariant. So it performs the aggregation of the neighbor uh, features. And if you apply it to every node of the graph, you get the output, which is known wise feature vectors that are uh, permutation equivariant. And it was shown in several recent works that this way of working with graphs, um, if you assume uh, some properties of this function phi, namely that it's injective, uh, makes this architecture equivalent to the vice for graph isomorphism test. So uh, those of you who are not familiar with this test, so it's a, a, an iterative uh, color refinement 
um, procedure that starts with a graph where every node is labeled in the same way, so it denoted by, by the blue color, and it uh, examines the neighborhood of every node. So initially we have uh, two types of neighborhoods. We have a blue node with two blue neighbors and blue node with three blue neighbors. So because of injectivity of phi, this will become two distinct colors that I denote here by uh, green and yellow. And I can repeat this procedure again. So now we have three types of nodes of neighborhoods and I can uh, again refine the colors until they stop changing at which point I will output the histogram of colors. And if I give you another graph and I get uh, a different distribution of colors, I can for sure say that they are not isomorphic. In other words, they are not structurally equivalent. I cannot find a, an edge preserving bijection between, uh, between these uh, two graphs. But uh, if the distribution of colors is the same, I actually don't know. So uh, uh, basically, this is a necessary but insufficient condition, and you can find examples of non isomorphic graphs that will be deemed equivalent from the standpoint of the vice Fred Lemon test. And so, uh, the reason. Question from the audience. So just to come back to your comment about uh, looking for continuous analogs of the graphs, there's, of course, a definition of a, a graph on which would yeah. be a candidate. Will you, you touch on that or comment? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll be talking about something else. So we would like to think of a graph as a discretization of continuous space, which is not a graph on. So this is more maybe like a uh, hyperbolic uh, space. So we'll, we'll get we'll get there okay. in a second. Yeah. Uh, and graph ones are in, in another, I think, slightly different uh, continuous model of, of, uh, of graphs. Uh, so basically, you can see easily why uh, the vice fred element uh, uh, test fails in this case, because if you pass uh, this iterative procedure into what actually the test sees, you will see that it, that it cannot detect structures such as, uh, for example, triangles, and th therefore these will be deemed equivalent. So we've done several works uh, on uh, making more expressive graph neural networks uh, through topological message passing. So in this case, we have a, a, a procedure that lifts uh, the graph, for example, to a cell or a complex, and now we have a, a higher order cells that are considered as a, a standalone object and they can receive messages from their constituent uh, nodes and edges and this way for example we can disambiguate these uh, these situations but then probably our arguably more common procedure is uh, what is called positional encoding so you attach to the nodes of the graph some extra features that uh, pre-color the graph so to say and uh, they uh, break these regularities that, that fail the the, the, the wl test and again, there are many ways of doing it. You can argue that, that random uh, features uh, could disambiguate. Maybe they are not generalizable, but at least uh, this is probably the best expressive power you can get. So they uh, localize the message passing. They tell, uh, they allow to distinguish between structure and similar nodes. You can use the, the graph of plus and eigenvectors uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but the, the, the truth is that we don't know how to correctly choose positional encoding. So there are many ways and some, some of them work, some of them don't in different situations. So we want to try to get principled approach for this as well. Now, another problem I would like to mention is that uh, in some cases, the craft neural networks perform poorly. There are multiple reasons to this. Uh, again, I don't have time to, to, uh, to go through all of them. One of them is the so-called over squashing phenomenon. So it happens when uh, depending on the kind of the problem that you try to solve on the graph uh, and the kind of the uh, structure, uh, the graph itself. So if I have a problem where I need to uh, propagate information from distant nodes and the graph has such structure that there are many distant nodes, so it has, for example, exponential volume growth, then I need to squeeze a lot of information into a single feature vector, into a single node. And this makes the, this uh, flow of information very inefficient. So, uh, uh, and uh, it was shown empirically that uh, multiple ways of rewiring the graph uh, can improve propagation. And this rewiring is actually uh, more or less standard architectural feature in modern graph neural networks, whether for computational reasons, if you have very large graphs, you must sample them. So you de facto use a different graph to aggregate information from maybe not all of your neighbors. You can use bigger filters that look at uh, multiple hops instead of just the, the immediate one hop neighborhood. You can uh, uh, make some shortcuts to improve this uh, propagation, diffuse the topology of the graph. You can learn the graph on which uh, uh, to do the propagation. For example, transformers, but this is what they do uh, uh, with uh, some uh, point of view. 
but the point again we don't have a, a rigorous way of uh, telling uh, what's the right way of rewriting the graph so we would like to address formally this question as well so what i will try to present next is uh, our attempt to give maybe some if not answers at least some directions uh, that can provide answers to these questions uh, continuous models for graphs and principled uh, take on positional encoding and uh, how to understand these over squashing and bottlenecks and maybe uh, do graph rewiring and uh, we also wrote uh, uh, high level um, popular blog posts on this so if you don't have time to read the papers uh, this is probably a, a way faster way to, to get the, the main idea so let me start with uh, the first problem uh, and we'll be talking about uh, graph neural diffusion and diffusion is probably one of the physical phenomena that has been studied for many years and one of the first uh, way of formalizing diffusion processes is an anonymous paper published in 1701 in the transactions of the Royal Society in Leiden uh, and even though there was no uh, name attached to it somehow everybody knew that uh, it was authored by Isaac Newton he would become Sir Isaac four years later and it described an experimental setting and some kind of global way of analyzing diffusion that nowadays we know as the Newton law of cooling so the temperature a hot body loses in a given time is proportional to the temperature difference between the object and the environment. Now, it was a little bit hodgepodge uh, of terminology. Newton used the word uh, calor, which in Latin literally means heat. And in modern physics, of course, it has the meaning of the flow of thermal energy is measured in uh, units of energy. Instead, the, the more appropriate term would be temperature that didn't exist at that time. So it took more than 100 years. So at that point, uh, differential calculus already existed. So uh, this time it was Joseph Fourier who formalized uh, the local version of diffusion that, that now bears also his name. And uh, it says that heat flux resulting from thermal conduction is proportional to the magnitude of the temperature gradient and opposite to its sign. And uh, the last bit is some form of conservation law. Uh, this is, uh, bears the name of uh, Adolf Eugen Fick the temperature changes in time equals to the heat flux of the volume. So this gives us the diffusion equation. So if we have some quantity, could be for example temperature, uh, it creates the, uh, the heat flux uh, that is inversely proportional to the gradient and the conservation condition give, gives us uh, basically the, the, the only change in time is uh, equal to, uh, to this uh, divergence of the, of the heat flux. So no heat is created or uh, disappears. And this way we get the, the, the famous diffusion equation. So it's a partial differential equation. We have the time derivative on the left hand side and the spatial derivative on the right hand side. And based on our assumptions on how this proportion coefficient that we denote here by A, the, the diffusivity, looks like we can get uh, either the isotropic version with constant diffusivity, where I can write the divergence of the gradient as the Laplacian operator. We can get uh, a more, um, we can also get a uh, um, uh, derivation basically where it comes from uh, as the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy that measures the smoothness uh, on some domain uh, and can also give it a closed form expression as the convolution with the Gaussian filter in the Euclidean uh, domain. Uh, we can look at the more interesting equations where the diffusivity is uh, position dependent. So this is isotropic non-homogeneous diffusion. And finally, the diffusivity can be a matrix valued function which is not only position but also direction dependent so this is what is called anisotropic diffusion now the non-homogeneous uh, diffusion equation became uh, very popular in image processing in the 90s starting from the seminal work of pietro perona and jitendra malik and the idea there was that uh, basically if you want to remove let's say noise from an image so you can convolve it with a gaussian so it will be some form of low pass filtering but then you will also destroy discontinuities in your image which are very important for visual perception so if you make a, a nonlinear diffusion with adaptive diffusivity that will tell you stop the diffusion when i have discontinuity in an image like what looks here so in this case the diffusivity function is inversely proportional to the norm of the image gradient and this gives you a, an adaptive diffusion that that allows to remove the noise in piecewise smooth regions and it stops uh, and doesn't blur the discontinuities and uh, you can compare the visually the result of uh, the, the face of uh, Sir Isaac blurred with standard uh, Gaussian filter as opposed to, to this uh, adaptive diffusion and they created an entire field of 
uh, image processing based on the variational methods and partial differential equations because it is a very elegant and very appealing idea that you start with some energy that tells you uh, the model of your ideal image, for example, it would look like something like total variation or maybe the diffusion energy. And you write the, the optimality condition for this functional uh, through the Euler Lagrange equation. And this gives you a, a partial differential equation, the gradient flow that will take you towards the optimum of this, uh, of this functional. And there are books written about anisotropic diffusion and image processing and how to use it and how to derive different uh, filters. Now, what happened with uh, the advent of deep learning that all these methods were wiped out because it is very difficult to axiomatically come up with a, a good model for how an image should look like. So what we are trying to, uh, to do here is uh, go back to some of these ideas that, that, that are uh, uh, elegant and deep and, and theoretically well motivated and uh, adapt them to non-Euclidean domains and adapt them to uh, deep learning tools. So uh, we, we are talking about graphs. So this is how uh, uh, to write the diffusion uh, equation on graphs. So essentially, we have uh, more or less one to one equivalent of all the differential operators that I defined before in the continuous case. So we can define the gradient. If I have uh, some uh, node features that I denote by x, the gradient takes the node features and makes them into an edge feature just by looking at the difference between uh, the two endpoints of, of an edge. The divergence does the opposite. So it collects the uh, uh, edge features that I denote here in red by y sums them up with the weights that represent the adjacency structure of the graph and uh, produces node-wise features. And uh, formally, these two operators are adjoint, so I can uh, think of the space of node signals and, and edge signals as uh, Hilbert spaces with respective inner products, and I can move the operators accordingly. And the Laplacian operator defined as the divergence of the gradient. Uh, you can think of it as a kind of uh, local difference between the feature or at a node and the average of uh, its surrounding. You can easily see it from this formula. So we can define exactly the same equation that we've seen before. So it has exactly the same structure. So here we have the gradient on the graph. This is the diffusivity function that we assume for simplicity to be normalized to one. So this stochastic and uh, this is the divergence. And uh, this is a nonlinear equation. So here, uh, the, the time parameter is continuous and we need to solve it numerically. So the easiest way would be to use an explicit forward Euler scheme. We discretize the time variable with a fixed uh, step size that is denoted by tau and replace the, uh, the temporal derivative with a forward difference in time. And this is how the numerical scheme looks like. So I can rewrite it in matrix form uh, as this iteration matrix Q. So you see that the, the next iteration is obtained as a linear aggregation of the features, uh, but the aggregation coefficients depend non-linearly on the features themselves. What is important that this matrix has the same uh, uh, sparse structure of the graph. So basically it is local. I collect information only from my neighbors. And you can show that if the step size is sufficiently small, then this uh, scheme is stable. So that's the standard stability results for uh, explicit Euler schemes. Now, what you can see that, uh, assuming that, that we have this normalization, you can interpret this diffusion as a, a graph attention network. So you can think of diffusivity as attention, and uh, we'll, we'll see that we can make it learnable. So it's a parametric function. And uh, for the time step of uh, unit size, we get uh, the, the famous uh, graph attention architecture by Petra Velichkovich from DeepMind, who is my uh, colleague and collaborator. Now, of course, you can use other uh, discretization schemes. So here is a semi-implicit or backward order scheme. So we can use a, a different way of uh, discretizing the derivative. And in this case, case, we have an implicit iteration formula. We need to solve a linear system or approximately invert this matrix P. And in this case, the iteration formula, uh, the matrix doesn't have any more the sparse structure of the graph. So it's dense. You can think of it as a kind of multi-hop filter. I need to aggregate information from multiple nodes that are not necessarily just one copy way. And of course, the advantage here is that uh, this scheme is unconditionally stable. You can use uh, any tau. Now, what is important, maybe this is uh, slightly nuanced, but a very important uh, point is that in standard numerical analysis, uh, here usually will come the trade-off 
of how efficient your discretization is, right? So you can make bigger steps in time, but you lose accuracy. In our case, we don't care about accuracy because we are not solving a diffusion equation. We use it to parameterize uh, a class of functions. So basically this diffusivity will be a, a learnable function. So it will be a parametric function. Uh, so you can think of a physical system that, that uh, performs uh, diffusion on a graph with some nodes. So these are parameters that I can tune and I'm trying to find such parameters that will produce a solution. So uh, the result of the diffusion equation at certain time t, that will uh, be good for some downstream task. So I don't care about accuracy here. I just want this uh, space of solutions to be sufficiently rich. Uh, and of course, we can use other schemes. So we can use uh, multi-step uh, adaptive step size schemes like the, the runge kuta methods and this uh, a zillion of different methods that exist in uh, uh, in numerical analysis literature, and uh, this is the the, the, the graph uh, neural diffusion uh, framework that we very modestly call Grand. So essentially, we start with some initial features that can be uh, optionally transformed by some learnable function. We solve the uh, graph diffusion equation using the iterative solver, and here the attention function or the diffusivity function is parametric. And uh, as a choice, we make it time independent. So it depends on x, which is a function of t, which are the, the features in time, but it is not a function of t independently. So in uh, graph neural network terminology or deep learning terminology, it means that we have shared parameters across layers. So each layer here corresponds to an iteration of the solver. And you may wonder what at all do we gain from this perspective? So the perspective, of course, is that we can analyze some of the uh, phenomena or standard plights of traditional graph neural network architectures as oversmoothing bottlenecks, as we'll see, uh, as we'll see next. And uh, it also gives rise to uh, new architectures. So not only interpreting existing architectures as uh, discretized versions of the, the graph diffusion equation, but also uh, maybe from more efficient solvers like multi-step, multi-grid or adaptive solvers that at least for now, uh, to my knowledge, do not have immediate architectural uh, incarnations uh, in the graph uh, neural network literature. And uh, implicit schemes can be interpreted, for example, as multi home filters. We have a lot of theory associated with, uh, uh, with differential equations like stability convergence. We can look at the limit cases. We can uh, say uh, something about the diffusion, uh, what is uh, its expressive power, whether it's, for example, uh, capable of linearly separating uh, some uh, classes of nodes on the graph. So a lot can be said, uh, say, uh, uh, leveraging this uh, theory. And it also creates uh, deeper links to other fields that are maybe less known in the machine learning or in particular in graph neural networks, such as differential geometry and algebraic topology. So we'll talk about it next. So here's one example. So one of the issues uh, with graph neural networks that somehow uh, in practice, it is notoriously difficult to make uh, deep graph neural networks. It requires a lot of regularization and some architectural uh, tricks like residual connections. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, graph neural networks tend to oversmooth, so all the features become the same. So in this case, we don't have the depth in the conventional sense, only if we use a fixed size explicit scheme, then we can relate the number of layers or the depth to the diffusion time through the step size. But in general, if we use uh, adaptive schemes, we can afford bigger steps when necessary. So less layers, less iterations, but the diffusion will, uh, the amount of diffusion will be the same. And in implicit schemes, we can trade off depth with width, right? So uh, uh, an analogy in uh, traditional convolutional networks would be using filters of bigger size with bigger support, or receptive fields. And you can see here that we can go uh, quite deep, like 32 iterations or 32 layers, and where, uh, whereas standard architectures would suffer, will drop in performance, this is a node classification task. Uh, in, in case of our uh, architecture, we don't suffer from, uh, from that. We can run the diffusion for a long time. And of course, uh, running it on standard benchmarks, we perform Epsilon better than, than uh, uh, some of the state-of-the-art methods. Without this, uh, you can forget about publishing the paper NeurIPS or ICML, but uh, this is uh, a necessary evil. Take it with a grain of salt. I think what maybe might be more interesting is to look at the comparison, let's say, to GUT, which performs uh, more or less on par, but it uses uh, more than 1.5 million parameters because it uses different parameters in every layer, whereas we use shared diffusivity, 
So the parameters are shared across iterations or across layers. So we have about 20 times less parameters to achieve the same performance. Now, in all this story, so far we discretized only time. So let me take a step back and go back again to our desire to, to come up with a continuous analogy of the graph. And if we think of a diffusion equation, how we will discretize it in the plane. So if I discretize the plane as a grid, I have different ways of uh, computing my discrete derivatives. So if I, let's say, compute, uh, if I were to compute the second order derivative, the Laplacian, I can use it, uh, I can use, um, for example, four neighbors on top, bottom, left, and right. I can rotate everything by 45 degrees, right? So use uh, this numerical stencil. I can use more distant neighbors. And because these operators are linear, any convex combination will also be a legitimate discretization of the derivative. So we want to uh, adopt a similar mindset to graphs. So we want to think of a graph as a kind of numerical convenience, but to forget about the graph and think of a continuous space. And the graph will be just its discretization. And uh, this is the point where we would like to talk about non-Euclidean version of the diffusion equation. So I remind you that, uh, well, with this uh, image processing uh, history, this is the kind of diffusion that was studied, the nonlinear uh, adaptive diffusion, where the diffusivity function depended on the uh, uh, position and specifically on the value of the norm of the gradient of the image at that position. Now, an alternative that was proposed by my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel, and his collaborators was to look at uh, a non-Euclidean version of diffusion with a, a non-Euclidean uh, Laplacian operator what is called the Laplace Beltrami, uh, Beltrami operator. And the idea here is that you can think of uh, your image as a manifold embedded in a joint space where you have the positional coordinates and the feature coordinates, right? So if you think of a, a, an RGB image, uh, it can be represented as a two-dimensional surface in five-dimensional space. So we have the X, Y coordinates and then R, G, and B, so five dimensions in total. And uh, you can pull back the metric from this space. It doesn't need to be Euclidean uh, uh, using the standard pullback mechanism. So you can define a metric on this manifold. And with respect to this metric, you can define uh, a, a Laplacian operator. So you can define an, a diffusion equation on this, uh, on this manifold. And I think this picture conveys the idea nicely. So now the, the, the arc length or the distance you measure on uh, this image represented as a surface uh, accounts both for positional distances, but also for feature distances. So if you have different uh, colors, then uh, it will take you a bigger distance to go from uh, point from to between pixels of different color. And we can show that uh, this diffusion equation minimizes a, a, a non-Euclidean version of the initial energy that is called, called Polyakov energy. So I think this is a function of this uh, popular in high energy physics, in particular in string theory. Don't ask me about its interpretation. I, uh, I have very rudimentary knowledge of, of, of physics. And uh, uh, this equation was called the Beltrami flow, uh, named after uh, uh, the, the, one of the early Italian differential geometers, uh, Eugenio Beltrami. And you can also derive uh, some of the, the, the previous equations that we've seen, the peron malik model, by uh, choosing the, the, uh, uh, this, this metric uh, appropriately. So the same, the same picture applied to a graph. Now we have a graph that uh, has both positional and uh, feature node coordinates. So I denote them by u and x, and we apply the diffusion equation to both. So now the, the diffusivity function depends on z, right, of the two nodes that are connected by an edge. So both the feature that is uh, attached to this, um, to this node, but also a positional encoding. And the idea is that if you had a way to embed the graph in some continuous space, such that you can recover the structure of the graph uh, from this, uh, this embedding, then you essentially you don't need the graph because all the information is contained in the positional encoding. In this case, we evolve the uh, positional encoding as part of, uh, uh, of this uh, Viltrami flow, right? So the evolution of X, the feature coordinate, gives us uh, a, new, a new feature at every node. So that we'll use for the downstream task, but so is the, uh, uh, the positional coordinate. So uh, the evolution of the U component gives us a different uh, representation of the graph, right? G different positional encoding. And now we can uh, change the graph on the fly. 
So I can decide that if two nodes came, became closer in this space, then I can connect them by an agent and aggregate information from neighbors that might be more relevant for this particular task. And uh, uh, basically, this is uh, a way of defining positional encoding that is uh, the best for the task that we are trying to solve. And maybe it was a little bit cumbersome explanation. So let me show you a picture that probably explains it way better. So here in this picture, you see a lot of things happening at the same time. So this is the famous Cora graph. So this is a citation network, uh, undirected graph. Uh, in this case, uh, the nodes are papers. They're, uh, represent the, the features uh, are some frequency of uh, different words that appear in the paper. So what you see is, uh, 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 encoded by color is a low dimensional projection of these feature vectors. What you see as positions of these uh, circles of these nodes uh, again, is a low dimensional representation of the positional encoding. And the graph is uh, the, the graph that we use for the computation. So it, it is rewired on the fly. And what you see, the task that we are trying to solve here is node wise classification. So we try to classify the field in which the paper was published. Uh, and you see that the graph evolves and the features evolve at the same time. So two things happen. And uh, we can also see that this is a very general framework, so it generalizes a lot of the previous architectures, including Grant that we've seen before, but uh, so also the graph attention networks, all the spectral uh, techniques, transformers, uh, different architectures with latent graph learning, where the graph is learned from uh, from the data, and uh, so on and so forth. And here, here again, we can use different discretization calculators uh, diffusion equation. And of course, uh, how can you publish without uh, achieving better results than, than the state of the art? So at least for the moment of publication, it outperformed uh, some uh, state of the art methods and some wage parts. Again, uh, I'm myself, I'm a bit cynical about uh, uh, being slightly better than, uh, than, than these benchmarks. So, let me now talk about uh, the third problem that uh, uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, which is uh, the bottlenecks and the over uh, over squashing phenomenon. And uh, probably from the previous slide, this uh, kind of picture, uh, well, maybe for uh, people uh, working in differential geometry, is uh, very uh, common and very natural picture. But for people in machine learning, it's very unusual to see that you you have a process that happens on the domain, and the domain is a kind of moving ground, so it changes under your feet. But in differential geometry, this is very common and actually a very powerful paradigm uh, uh, to evolve a manifold uh, by some uh, differential equation. And probably the most famous of, of these is uh, what is called the Ricci flow, which is structurally very similar to the diffusion equation. So we have the, the Riemannian metric G on the left hand side that changes in time. And uh, it is changes uh, in proportion to the, Riemannian, to, the, to the Ricci curvature tensor, which is also second order quantity, so it's a little bit similar to the Laplacian, and that's why very, with very gross oversimplification, uh, sometimes the Ricci flow is called the diffusion of the metric, but of course it has very different properties. And uh, uh, so the, 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 the Ricci uh, um, the curvature was introduced by Gregorio Ricci Corbastro, again, one of the early Italian differential geometers, and the mechanism of Ricci flows was uh, proposed by Richard uh, Hamilton, uh, in an in attempt or uh, uh, as uh, apparatus to prove the, the famous Poincaré conjecture, which was proven uh, by Grigori Perelman exactly using this uh, mechanism or a version of Ricci flow with uh, surgery. So uh, what does it have to do with graphs? I remind you that the problem we want to study is this phenomenon of forward scorching, which is the failure of message passing or graph neural networks to efficiently propagate information uh, in a graph due to some structural characteristics of the graph that we call bottlenecks. And uh, it occurs in problems where we have long distance dependencies, where we need information from many hops away. And some typical examples are uh, 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 graph neural networks applied to, to problems in chemistry, to molecular graphs, where, for example, I, when I need to predict some property of uh, a molecule, I need information from atoms on two different sides of the molecule. It occurs in graphs which are unlikely to have exponential uh, volume growth, so there were the too many neighbors, and uh, it tends to deteriorate with the depth of, uh, the, uh, of the uh, neural network, and uh, it is empirically shown to be alleviated by graph rewiring. 
So what we show in the paper, so this is the paper that was recently accepted uh, to iClear, but it's available in the archive, is we will try to formally uh, define our squashing in graph as a form of uh, sensitivity related to structural characteristics of the graph that are measured geometrically through so some form of uh, discrete curvature. And then uh, we can use this result to uh, propose a graph rewiring that is inspired by Ricci flow and is surgical in nature. So let's start with the characterization of over squashing. So essentially what over squashing does is that if I have uh, a multi-layer uh, message passing type graph neural network, so it takes information from nodes and propagates them on the graph several times. Let's assume that, so these are the aggregation functions that I have in my graph neural network, the Lipschitz continues. So the Lipschitz constants uh, here are denoted by alpha and beta. So essentially over squashing is the sensitivity of the output of a graph neural network at some node to the input features of uh, a node that is R distant from that node, okay? And uh, basically it can be measured through the Jacobian, through the derivative of the output with respect to that input. And what we can show is that I, I, we can bound this Jacobian by some constants that depend on the, the, how smooth or how continuous this, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the activations or the aggregation functions of the graph neural network, and also something that has to do with the structure of the graph through some power of the, uh, 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 of the adjustancy matrix. A. Uh, so you can see that there are some pathological cases like trees are very bad, we have, they have very fast uh, growing number of neighbors. So in this case, uh, the propagation of information is, uh, is very poor. But uh, basically the bottleneck is hidden here. So we see that uh, the graph structure is somehow to blame, but it's not uh, evident. So it's very much implicit there. And we want something more uh, nuanced and, and, and more um, fine-grained analysis uh, uh, to apply to the, to the structure of the graph to, to try to get to the root of what causes this over-squashing phenomenon. And the standard way of uh, dealing with different structures in differential geometry is through the notion of curvature, because intuitively we expect that, for example, a tree will be worse than a grid, right, in a graph. So this is analogous to what happens in manifolds, where we can study how uh, geodesics behave. So if I take two points that I denote here by P and Q and I shoot out geodesics that are initially parallel and go at the same velocity, if they converge, then locally I look like a sphere, so it's positive curvature. If they remain parallel, then locally I'm flat, so it's Euclidean plane, or Euclidean space in general. Or if they diverge, then I have hyperbolic surface and it has negative curvature. So something like this can be defined on graphs. So I can take two nodes that are connected by an edge. And uh, if I shoot geodesics, right, right, so if I have edges that emanate from these nodes and they tend to form triangles, then this is a kind of convergence. If they tend to form rectangles, it, it is kind of remaining parallel, right? And if they tend to become more distant, then this is a tree. And uh, this is uh, similar to divergent geodesics. So there are several constructions of discrete curvature that can be defined on graphs. The most famous are due to Foreman and Olivier. And we propose our own construction that uh, is similar in spirit to Foreman, but we want to mimic exactly what happens in the continuous case. So allow me to skip the details. Basically, uh, it is based on counting uh, 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 rectangles and triangles uh, uh, around an edge. So it's an edge-based curvature. So we give uh, a value of curvature uh, for every edge. And uh, it behaves as expected. So clicks have positive curvature, grids have zero curvature, and trees have negative curvature. We can show that it's a lower bound on the Olivier curvature. So uh, with Olivier comes uh, a bridge uh, theory of optimal transportation that was studied by uh, uh, Delany and Figali and others. So uh, there is quite some heavy artillery there. Uh, we can also show that if the, the graph has uh, strictly positive curvature, then uh, the volume growth is polynomial. And we can also bound the Chigger constant, which is uh, uh, related to spectral gap of the, 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 the graph of plus and, and it's a kind of criterion of uh, clusteredness of uh, the graph. So the main result of this paper, again, allow me to skip the details. It tells you that if you have a negatively curved graph, then there is a large set of nodes for which this Jacobian 
is small. So in other words, we have uh, we have over squashing, we have poor propagation of information, and uh, simply put, the conclusion is that over squashing is caused by negatively curved edges. So we can relate uh, the curvature of the graph to this phenomenon of over squashing. So we can we can get to the root of the bottleneck and describe bottleneck in terms of curvature. Now, this immediately allows us to propose a way of rewiring the graph. So we uh, call this stochastic discrete Ricci flow. So it's not exactly a Ricci flow, it's inspired by a Ricci flow. And basically the idea is to cut uh, edges that have small negative Ricci curvature and optionally replace them with uh, other edges that will uh, connect these uh, and uh, uh, cure these bottlenecks. And uh, what we also show that some other type, types of graph rewiring that are popular in the literature, like a method that was proposed by uh, the group of Stefan Gunemann in Munich, that they call maybe a little bit ambitiously Deagle or Diffusion Improves Graph Learning. So it's based on embedding the graph using personalized page rank and then uh, computing k nearest neighbor graph in that space. So it's a kind of diffusive, diffusion of the, of the graph connectivity. And what we show is that for given uh, uh, sigma, so this is the parameter that controls the strength of the diffusion. Uh, the trigger constant of the revised graph is dominated by the trigger constant of the original graph. And you can come up with pathological examples like this. So these are two clicks connected by a bridge. And in this case, the trigger constant can be made arbitrarily small if you grow this, uh, the number of nodes in this graph to infinity. So in this case, actually, this kind of rewiring will not help. So our conclusion is that. Deagle is not a good name, so uh, the, the diffusion of connectivity of the graph doesn't necessarily improve graph bottlenecks. And uh, it is also uh, quite understandable why, because uh, uh, based on diffusion, what uh, what Deagle does, it tends to uh, connect nodes at small diffusion distance. So basically, it tends to connect nodes that belong to the same community structure in the graph. And when it comes to practical applications, uh, it seems to work nicely in case where the data is homophilic on the graph, meaning that my neighbors are similar to me. So if this is the, an example like shown here, if I add a few edges within the same uh, uh, the same uh, uh, connected structure in the graph, then uh, it will not do any harm, right? So I will get information from nodes that, that roughly look like me, so I will be able to aggregate this information, denoise, and so on, and uh, uh, it will uh, only improve the performance of graph neural networks. Uh, our uh, curvature-based rewiring will just introduce or cut a few edges, so it will also not do any harm. But when the graph is heterophilic, when the neighbors are not similar to, uh, to myself, then uh, this kind of diffusion-based rewiring will create a lot of disasters, so it will connect me to nodes that have nothing to do with me. So the, in this case, uh, the neural network might learn not to use the neighbors at all. And they will contain mostly irrelevant information. And again, curvature-based rewiring is very subtle, so it's surgical. So if it creates a few bridges between uh, unrelated nodes, so it will not uh, do much harm. And you can see also that the structure of the graph is uh, changed dramatically by, uh, by diffusion-based methods, whereas uh, the curvature rewiring is, uh, again, is very subtle and, and surgical. And we show that we can get a uh, significant improvement in the performance of graph neural networks if they're rewired uh, using the, the curvature-based techniques, especially for uh, uh, data sets with low homophily. So we have some more results. So this is an old table. And um, yeah, basically, uh, uh, we, uh, I'm not selling this as a method that, that works in practice, but I think it's, uh, it's a good way of understanding this uh, phenomenon on the graph. Is there a question? Uh, yeah, so the question about surgery is playing an important role in continuous Ricci flow. To what extent did this motivate details of your graph modification algorithm? Not really. So I think the, 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 the analogy to, to Ricci flow is, uh, especially Ricci flow with uh, surgery, as was used in the Poincaré conjecture, is, uh, well, you don't have these kind of problems here, or at least not that I'm aware of. Um, so to wrap up, uh, just to summarize, I think uh, there are many interesting links between uh, graph neural networks, differential geometry, PDEs, and algebraic topology. I didn't say much about algebraic topology, but this is a recent work where we 
define on a graph what is called cellular sheaf. So it's uh, extra structure that in this case can be considered maybe uh, by analogy to differential geometry as a way of doing parallel transport. So these are linear transformations that uh, uh, change the vectors when I move them from one node to another. And uh, you can think of, um, again, by analogy to parallel transport, when I move a vector in the plane, uh, nothing happens to this vector, right? I can add or subtract two points uh, on the Euclidean space. On the manifold, when I move a vector from one point to another, I need to, uh, to rotate it, right? So there is uh, more generally a connection that acts on these, on these vectors. So in a sense, by uh, basically by building a shift on, on the graph, uh, we endow the graph with, uh, with some geometry that actually can be learned from the data. So we make the graph uh, more interesting for the given task. And what we show that if, uh, we can write diffusion equations on the shift. Uh, so uh, they look, uh, you can write them as uh, block uh, matrices. And we look at the limit uh, case of these diffusion equations. We show that the, 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 uh, the, the space of solutions is much more interesting when the shift is non-trivial. And it especially works well with uh, heterophilic data uh, because we can, with these restriction maps, we can, uh, for example, uh, account for discrepancies between between different data, uh, and different uh, different nodes. So uh, I think it also brings uh, interesting new and uh, powerful tools to study graph machine learning problems uh, from different perspectives. Uh, it uh, allows to take at least some somewhat principal take on different uh, otherwise. Um, previously empirical choices in uh, graph neural network literature, such as positional encoding or graph rewiring. And I think it's just the beginning. So there are many interesting open questions. So we have several follow-up works that are still unpublished, but that explore, for example, different physical uh, models uh, in addition to diffusion. And uh, I think it's a very interesting topic to study, and especially uh, from people coming, by people coming from theoretical uh, math community uh, working on this uh, in these fields. So uh, this is a joke because today is the Groundhog Day. So uh, I will stop here and will not go over my talk again and again and again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? I have a question. Please. Um, so, does this does this framework and ideas have have something to say about um, kind of the special cases of like a fully connected graph, like using a transformer? Um, yeah, good question. So, transformers. Well, you can think of transformers as graph neural networks with a fully connected graph with uh, uh, with uh, attention uh, right or learnable diffusivity function, and uh, in this case, you can. Uh, Basically, you can think of it as a latent graph uh, learning that that comes through uh, in the form of soft adjacency, right? The, 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 the attention weights. So there is no big difference in this uh, sense. Uh, uh, basically, whether you assume that the graph is given a priori or is it or is it fully connected. So what was shown in the paper that that identified the bottlenecks uh, problem in graphs was that. Uh, if you do a few layers of propagation on the input graph and then you do rewiring that is fully connected, then uh, it allows to improve the performance, uh, performance of graph neural networks. And uh, to me, again, uh, uh, it is slightly subtle because the graph has two functions in graph neural networks. It's both part of the input and the computational structure that you use. And um, what, what seems to be the right approach is some form of coupled processes. So what we did with the Ricci flow was uh, a form of pre-processing, but it doesn't need to be pre-processing. So you should probably have two processes, let's say diffusion equations. One of them evolves the domain and another one evolves uh, the data of the domain. So you have, inform you have uh, features that diffuse on the graph and the graph itself changes underneath, right? So you can think of attention doing something like this. So it changes the metric on the graph. Uh, yeah, so that that would probably be uh, uh, interpretation of transformers from this perspective. Okay, thank you. More questions? I have one. Um, so uh, 
Corey, Scott, and I have some work that starts out similarly, but uh, yours is very impressive. I, I, I really like your talk. Um, but the idea of using a graph Laplacian uh, to then we try to um, to um, uh, define a distance between graphs, uh, much as graphons do, but based on the graph Laplacian, and um, look at convergence in that distance as you approach, as your graph gets bigger and bigger in a graph, what we call a graph limit of um, increasing size graphs. And if they have the right structure, then the distance can get smaller and you get a convergence to a continuum limit. And that might have the some advantages. It's it's very similar in spirit to, to the where you start, but it also lets you have a multi-grid method uh, sort of naturally. Um, and I wonder if uh, you uh, see some commonalities in in that approach to what you're doing. Yeah. So I I should say that that. Uh... I, I have not seen this work, so I, this is very interesting. So, well, we, we've been looking at multi-grid methods, but more uh, maybe more traditionally in the sense that some form of graph coarsening that can also be learned. So we used a uh, um, slightly similar technique, but completely differently for proving the stability of spectral graph neural networks by uh, considering a metric space that, that is uh, sampled. And you can define Laplacian on a very general uh, metric space, so it doesn't need to be even even a vector space. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but uh, I would be very uh, very interested to see uh, the paper that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I put it into chat. I, I, th I think it's a, a, a different but related uh, set of ideas. Uh, Jim, did you have another question? Or? Just ask one now. Uh, great talk, Michael. Thanks a lot. Um, so, just I, I know this Weisfeiler Lehman result from a couple of years ago, and you emphasized that the current GNNs are more expressive and more powerful than, than the previous generation. Is there a, a, a comparison of how much more powerful, or is there some other problem yeah. analogous to the comparison to Weisfeiler Lehman that can be said about the current generation? Yeah, good question. So, uh... So the standard way of analyzing the expressive power is uh, uh, using the, the hierarchy of uh, uh, KWL tests, right? So there are uh, other strictly stronger versions of uh, WL tests that is not local. And uh, so what is usually shown, the typical results, and this is what we also show, that, that uh, you are not uh, less powerful than the WL. So you can show some cases typically involving regular graph or uh, K isoregular graphs where uh, with maybe injection of additional structure, like counting certain structures like triangles, cycles, and so on, you can disambiguate these graphs, whereas uh, KWL cannot. And you can always construct uh, such structures uh, uh, to disambiguate. So um, uh, it is related actually to reconstruction conjectures uh, in graphs. So reconstruction conjectures, or one of the flavors uh, says that if you look at the collection of graphs where you remove uh, every time uh, one node or one edge, right? So all the, the set of edge uh, uh, or node re uh, removed graphs, whether you can recover the graph from this collection. And uh, recent works, including our own, that will also appear at clear, shows that you can get this way. Basically, if you look at the graph as a collection of subgraphs that are obtained by some policy, you can get strictly more powerful uh, 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 architecture than the WL, again, in the sense that Anything that WL can distinguish can be distinguished by such architecture, but you can find counterexamples that, uh, or known counterexamples that WL cannot distinguish, and this method can. Now, in terms of the expressive power, so I think it's a little bit, uh, well, again, we did su such works as well, so I'm criticizing myself. I don't want to criticize others. Um, it is, in a sense, it's easy because this analogy is, is more or less straightforward, but it does doesn't give you much, right? So it tells you that certain types of functions can be uh, computed with uh, graph neural networks. It doesn't tell you anything about the uh, generalization capability of, uh, of such graph neural networks. And uh, it also doesn't uh, give you any um, approximate results. And what is problematic with vice for lemon because uh, it assumes that you use the same graph to propagate information as the input graph, which is in mo most modern architectures is not the case. The graph is usually rewired in some form, whether uh, explicitly or implicitly. So I find much more interesting uh, to look at the, these 
physical or physics-inspired systems such as uh, uh, differential equations, diffusion processes. We also have a paper where we looked at a uh, couple of oscillators uh, uh, on a graph or maybe some other systems. And uh, basically think of the solutions of these equations as the class of functions that, uh, that, that you can represent. And then it becomes a question of controllability. So whether you can, uh, by choosing the parameters that parameterize this system, maybe a trajectory, so it's not a single set of parameters, uh, you can achieve a certain solution, or maybe you can ask how far can you can how far you can be from that uh, from that function that you try to approximate. This is something that device for element formalism cannot do because it works with discrete labels. So uh, I think it gives a completely different perspective that is probably more useful, in my opinion. Thank you. Let, let me let me uh, just try to continue that 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 question because it's it's i think you're also answering a question that i was going to ask which is that uh you encourage you have a, you know, both uh interesting results that that touch on uh, differential geometry uh graph geometry and so forth and encourage uh you know mathematicians you know theorists to work on this and uh, then of course you know, to, to work theoretically, you need to have uh, theoretically uh, posed problems. You, you, you can't, there's a limit to what you can do just with a, a data set. And uh, so the, the, there's a lot of work, for example, on this WL test because it's such a simple theoretically posed test. And uh, so one needs more tests if you want the, the theorist to go beyond that. And uh, then for, for you know, feed forward network, for, for a lot of uh, deep learning, of course, uh, the, the, the basic test is a function approximation. And uh, so it sounds like in your answer to Jim, you were also proposing that, that, that uh, you know, physical systems, dynamical systems produce uh, dynamics and you'd like to be able to approximate those types of functions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay, I mean, so, 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 so is that a work in progress or is that something that you spell out in the paper already or? So we have some results so in the paper that is not published. Well, I hope that we'll publish it in maybe next week or uh, so. It's it's also a submission. Um, we uh, we show it for uh, a different physical system. So it's a uh, oscillatory system um, coupled uh, ODEs, where we show that uh, we don't have um, a decay into uh, 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 zero Dirichlet energy. So we don't over smooth. And we also have some stability results. So it's not exactly a controllability result as uh, one would uh, ideally uh, design in this case, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a result that, that basically that looks at uh, how the system behaves in well, some, some uh, state space. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we are, we are, we are trying to, to, to generalize this result for, uh, for other systems as well and uh, to use uh, the, the uh, control theory of uh, PDEs uh, to prove some bounds, so to, basically to, to, to express expressive, expressive power in this way. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, more questions? Uh, if not, uh, well, uh, one more. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I uh, uh, am so curious to look back uh, at the Ricci flow slides again, and I can't help but ask uh, a related question. Uh, you know, so so. Some of it certainly is motivated in detail in the sense that you wrote down these, these differential operators on the graph that were motivated by what we actually sort of would see in a continuous setup. There's also this story of Perelman that you can think of Ricci flow as coming from gradient flow with a particular scalar loss functional. Did you try to realize that in this context? Um, did you think yeah. that? Yeah, good question. So we did. Uh, it was not very satisfactory. I think now we can do better. So uh, again, the subtlety there that we don't have uh, uh, a mechanism for doing uh, an analogy of metric pullback on graphs. So we, we, we need to reinvent this. But other than that, with maybe some structural uh, 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 structural constraints, we can uh, write an energy that looks as a discrete analogy. It's not a discretization, but an analogy of the of the Polyakov action. And uh, in this sense, yes, we can show that the Beltrami flow, the graph Beltrami flow, is a gradient flow of this kind of energy, which is also interesting because for many uh, physical systems, you you have some associated energy, uh, well, like Lagrangian, right? So, so um, it gives you some form of interpretability. You know what the graph neural networks tries to do. Uh, I think in traditional graph neural networks, you have no idea what it does. 
Great, thank you. More questions? Um, okay, it seems like uh, we're satisfied. So, well, that was a really great talk, uh, Michael. Thanks very much. Thank you again. And uh, okay. so, uh, let's see, next week we have uh, Ben uh, Edelman of uh, our own uh, Harvard Computer Science Department who will tell us about uh, theoretical approaches to uh, transformers. So I uh, hope to see you all there. And uh, thanks again, Michael. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you. Bye. Okay.